it that humans are still here and the rest of the hominins are extinct. A new paper came out recently that may have added another piece to the puzzle and gotten us a bit closer to understanding why we are the only hominins remaining on planet Earth. very modern apes. I'm your host, Gutsy Gibbon, and today, of course, we're trying to suss out why humans are the only hominins left on the planet when 300,000 years ago we emerged and shared the planet with half a dozen, if not more, other hominins. We shared the planet at that time with Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalensis, Denisovans. We shared it with Homo floresiensis and Homo lusinensis, as well as Homo naledi, and depending on who you talk to, perhaps even Homo erectus and others. So why are we the last ones? <laughs> The answer to this question has been traditionally just kind of a vague gesturing at humans are smarter, but this idea has been taking some hits with the continued discovery of Neanderthal skulls and the finding that their average brain case size is at the level of, if not greater than, Homo sapiens. Not only that, but the more we learn about Neanderthal culture, the more we understand that they were very similar to the humans living at that time period, especially in the fact that they had this broad material tool culture that they used to investigate and exploit the world around them. They were capable of procuring marine resources from fish to clams, and they were also capable of hunting massive mammals that roamed the Eurasian steppes. Neanderthals may have decorated their dead with paint and flowers before burying them, implying at least some understanding of death and symbolism. Some propose that they've created art and even musical instruments, and we know for a fact they interacted with humans as well as interbreeding with humans and another hominin living at the time, Denisovans. These guys were clearly very complicated animals, just like our own species. So why are they gone? Recently, scientists have been toying with the idea that it has nothing to do with absolute brain case size and rather has to do with the wiring and organization of the brain's parts, which is an interesting idea, although tougher to test. We have endocasts, that is to say, we have the skulls and the imprint that the brain left on the inside of the skull, which can at least give us an idea on which parts of the brain were emphasized in an animal, but it's a lot more difficult to understand what's going on outside of just the impression that it leaves on the bone around it. We've gotten a good place to start, however, because endocasts at least show us which part of the brain lobe-wise are emphasized in Homo sapiens versus Homo neanderthalensis. Neanderthals have large occipital lobes. So the four lobes of the brain, you have the frontal, the parietals, the temporals, and the occipital in the back. And the occipital is responsible for things like vision and motion and color. So this would have made them very, very good at hunting. They would have kicked our butts in any of the Olympic sports as well with that hand-eye coordination. Humans, on the other hand, have an emphasis on the frontal lobe. This is the frontal lobe right here, right behind your forehead. It makes sense, it's pretty intuitive. And the frontal lobe is responsible for primarily cognition and with that, critical thinking. These are of course massive simplifications, but I hope that it can at least get across to you the idea that while Neanderthals and humans both had big brains, they had a focus on different things. So perhaps then wiring is where we need to look. Of course, that can't do that with the skull, so scientists have turned to genetics, which is perfect because we have the human genome as well as the Neanderthal genome and Denisovans as well as some more archaic human DNA. 
Now we've obviously isolated several differences in humans and Neanderthals. However, I want to focus on one very specific difference that was recently sussed out. This paper came out just a few days ago, and it's called Human Transketolase Like 1 Implies Greater Neurogenesis in Frontal Neocortex of Modern Humans Than Neanderthals. Okay, what does all of this mean, right? I want to break it down for you. So transketolase like one is a type of enzyme. Enzymes are types of proteins and proteins are created via protein synthesis. You remember protein synthesis from middle school and high school. This is transcription, which happens in the nucleus. And then of course we trudge on out into the cytoplasm at the ribosome specifically where translation happens and you get this nice little string of amino acids that together constitute a protein. The type of protein is determined by what amino acids you're creating and then the order of those amino acids. In the case of proteins, you need 50 or more of these amino acids all strung together. And the difference we're talking about today between humans and Neanderthals is a single amino acid substitution, one in that 50 or more chain, and it has a drastic impact on phenotype. So this paper isn't open access yet. So if you want to read the whole thing, you might have to consult some kind of science hub for that. But I will be going over what is published and having read the paper through my institution, adding some additional comments here and there. In this first section on Neanderthal brain development, they note Neanderthal brains were similar in size to those of modern humans, but different in shape. We already talked about this earlier. What we cannot tell from fossils is how the Neanderthal brains might have differed in functional organization of brain layers, such as the neocortex. So for those of you who don't know, the neocortex is like colloquially known as the mammalian brain, and it's pretty complicated. Birds have kind of their own version of it, but the neocortex is generally associated with sort of higher function. Pinson et al have now analyzed the effect of a single amino acid change on the transketolase-like one protein on the production of basal radial glia, the workhorses that generate much of the neocortex. Modern humans differ from apes and Neanderthals by this single amino acid change. When placed in organoids or overexpressed in non-human brains, the human variant of transketolase-like one drove more generations of neuroprogenitors than did the archaic variant. The authors suggest that the modern human has more neocortex to work with than the ancient Neanderthal did. So let's break this down. So we've got this enzyme, right? Transketolase like one. And it's found in all apes living and extinct. So humans have it, chimps have it, gorillas have it, Neanderthals have it, Denisovans has it, et cetera, et cetera. But in humans, it's slightly different due to a substitution at one of those amino acids on the chain that makes the protein itself. That's a tiny, minute difference. And the interesting thing is, as they noted, it's different even in modern humans as compared to archaic members of our own species. So things that we consider Homo sapiens living 300,000 years ago would have the archaic version and modern humans, every single human living on the planet today, have this new version. Not only that, but this particular enzyme is related to brain development in the neocortex, a part of the brain that is responsible for, among other things, higher cognitive abilities. So let's get into it a little bit more. So in the structured abstract, they go over some of the things we've already touched on in this video, the importance of the neocortex with regard to cognition. And they kind of lament the fact that endocasts can only get us so far because clearly there's a difference between humans and Neanderthals, we're here and they're not. And yet the brain case size is basically the same, not just the brain case itself, but specifically the neocortex as well. And then they pose the question that kind of sets the stage for the rest of the paper. They say, but whether similar neocortex size implies similar neocortical neuron production remains unclear. So you've got the size of the neocortex itself, and then you've got the kind of density of the neurons within, as well as how many neurons are produced. And that's kind of what they're asking. And this is why they focus specifically on transketolase like one. They note that it's preferentially expressed in the two classes of neuroprogenitors, but specifically that the basal progenitors in the subventricular zone, uh, which can be divided into two types, the basal intermediate progenitors and the basal radial glia, are responsible for promoting and self-amplifying. So they're the type of neuroprogenitors that are considered to be the driver of the increase in cortical neuron production. 
which is important. So <laughs> to put this really simply, transketolase like one aids in the production of basal radial glia, which in turn make more neurons. But, and this is the critical observation, the transketolase like one that is found in anatomically modern humans living on the planet today is ever so slightly different than the transketolase like one found in all other hominins and even earlier versions of our own species. They thought to themselves, it's different. Why? What does this difference do, if anything? And that was really what they set out to do here. They know transketolase like one is one of the few proteins with a single amino acid substitution found in essentially all present day humans, but absent from the extinct archaic humans, the Neanderthals, Denisovans, and other primates. This human specific amino acid substitution in transketolase like one is a lysine in apes, but and in archaic humans, but an arginine in modern humans. We therefore investigated one, whether or not transketolase like one has a role in neocortex development and affects neoprogenitor cells, excuse me, neuroprogenitor numbers, and two, whether both archaic transketolase like one, which is abbreviated as A transketolase like one, and modern humans transketolase like one, abbreviated as H transketolase like one, exert similar effects on neuroprogenitors during neuro, or excuse me, neocortex development. So it's a simple question, right? Is the transketolase like one found in humans that is slightly tweaked just doing the same thing? Is it an arbitrary tweak that doesn't actually have a functional impact? Or is it important in distinguishing modern humans from all other hominins? And again, part of the reason we're so successful. Okay, so how did we test this? Well, like most things, we used other organisms. So they took human transketolase like one and archaic transketolase like one. So the version that's in modern humans versus the version that's in all other apes, including very early members of our own species. And they stuck them both into mouse embryos, the neocortex specifically. Now, these guys don't have transketolase like one expression at all. So this is basically just a comparison to see what increases the basal radial glia more, the human version or the archaic version. And what they note is that human transketolase like one increased the abundance of basal radial glia without affecting sort of any of these other progenitor types. And they note that the effect was limited to only the human transketolase like one, um, not the archaic transketolase like one, which differs by only one amino acid and was unable to increase the basal radial glia abundance. That is, that's big. That means the human version can be implanted in a completely different species and have a massive impact, but this archaic version cannot. Uh, they go on to say the greater basal glia, eh, the greater basal radial glia abundance upon the human transketolase like one expression resulted in an increase in the cortical neuron production over time, specifically by the late born upper layer neurons rather than those of the earlier born deep layer neurons. Um, and then they did the same thing with ferrets. They say in the folded uh, gyroencephalic developing ferret neocortex, human transketolase like one expression increased not only the basal radial glial radial glia, excuse me, abundance, but also the proportion of basal radial glia with multiple processes, a hallmark of basal radial glia that can self amplify. As a consequence, the gyrus size increased. So this actually increased the size of a portion of the brain. Also big, right? So first we've got the human, the human transculase like one impacting other species, but it's also impacting them in positive and large ways. Then they say in the fetal human neocortex, human transketolase like one was essential to maintain the full number of basal radial glia. So what they did is they took human tissue and they knocked out the human transketolase like one. And they noted that it, it experienced a reduction. It couldn't meet its potential and couldn't produce as many basal radial glia and thus couldn't have as many neurons. They say to further demonstrate this effect, we converted the human transketolase like one to the Neanderthal version. So they used the archaic transketolase like one in human embryonic stem cells and generated mini brain structures called cerebral organoids. So they're just little miniature versions of brains. The archaic transketolase like one expressing organoids contained fewer basal radial glia and neurons. Hence the human specific lysine to arginine or yeah, to arginine uh, substitution in human transketolase like one is essential for maintaining the full number of basal radial glia and neurons in the human brain model. In the fetal human neocortex, humans trans, human transketolase like one expression in neuroprogenitors increased during the course of the neurogenesis 
and was particularly high in developing the frontal lobe as compared to the developing occipital lobe. So this is pretty much in line precisely with the observation from earlier that the frontal lobe is significantly more emphasized in humans than it is in Neanderthals. And thus, this interestingly associated human transcutaneous like one impacts the frontal lobe and is present in humans. It doesn't impact the occipital lobe and is not present in Neanderthals. It means that part of the cognitive advantage that humans, anatomically modern Homo sapiens, evidently had over other hominins living at the time can be owed to a single minute change, as small as substituting an amino acid from lysine to arginine in one protein. Specifically, it's a change at point 261 in a 540 amino acid chain that makes up the actual protein of transcutylase like one. This single change evidently resulted in a chain reaction by allowing for the production of more basal radial glia and thus more neurons and thus a more efficient cognitively advanced frontal lobe in anatomically modern humans as compared to Neanderthals. This may have been what gave ancient humans, or I guess not so ancient humans, a competitive edge in a changing landscape. This is kind of the spiritual successor to that old series that I did, Science in Motion. I kind of want to bring back this coverage of more recent papers and how that applies to our current understanding of human evolution and primatology. So hopefully I'll see you next time in another one of these.